one side with Levine. Levine was wild-eyed, his body moving in a twitchy way. The drive in the jeep seemed to have finished him off. What is she talking about, he said. We're trapped here. Trapped! There was hysteria in his voice. We can't go anywhere. We can't do anything. I'm telling you, we're all gonna d Keep it down, Thorne said, grabbing his arm, leaning close. Don't upset the kids. What difference does it make, Levine said. They're gonna find out sooner. Ow! Take it easy! Thorne was squeezing his arm hard. He leaned close to Levine. You're too old to act like an asshole, he said quietly. Now pull yourself together, Richard. Are you listening to me, Richard? Levine nodded. Good. Now, Richard, I'm going to go outside and see if the pumps work. They can't possibly work, Levine said. Not after five years. I'm telling you, it's a waste of... Richard, Thorne said. We have to check the pumps. There was a pause. The two men looked at each other. You mean you're going outside, Levine said? Yes. Levine frowned. Another pause. Crouched over Arby, Sarah said, Where are the lights, guys? Just a minute, Thorne said to her. He leaned close to Levine. Okay? Okay, Levine said, taking a breath. Thorne went to the front door, opened it, and stepped out into darkness. Levine closed the door behind him. Thorne heard a click as the door locked. He immediately turned and rapped softly. Levine opened the door a few inches, peering out. For Christ's sake, Thorne whispered, don't lock it. But I just thought... Don't lock the damn door. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. For Christ's sake, Thorne said. He closed the door again and turned to face the night. Around him, the worker village was silent. He heard only the steady drone of cicadas in the darkness. It seemed almost too quiet, he thought. But perhaps it was just the contrast from the snarling raptors. <laughs> Thorne stood with his back to the door for a long time. Staring out at the clearing, he saw nothing. Finally, he walked over to the jeep, opened the side door, and fumbled in the dark for the radio. His hand touched it. It had slid under the passenger seat. He pulled it out and carried it back to the store, knocked on the door. Bean opened it, said, It's not locked. Here. Thorne handed him the radio, closed the door again. Again he paused, watching. Around him, the compound was silent. The moon was full. The air was still. He moved forward and peered closely at the gas pumps. The handle of the nearest one was rusted and draped with spider webs. He pulled the nozzle up and flicked the latch. Nothing happened. He squeezed the nozzle handle. No liquid came out. He tapped the glass window on the pump that showed the number of gallons and the glass fell out in his hand. Inside, a spider scurried across the metal numerals. There was no gas. They had to find gas, or they'd never get to the helicopter. He frowned at the pumps, thinking. They were simple, the kind of very reliable pumps you found at a remote construction site. And that made sense, because, after all, this was an island. He paused. This was an island. That meant everything came in by plane or boat. Most times, probably by boat. Small boats, where supplies were offloaded by hand. Which meant... He bent over, examining the base of the pump in the moonlight. Just as he thought, there were no buried gas tanks. He saw a thick, black PVC pipe running at an angle just under the ground. He could see the direction the pipe was going, around the side of the store. Thorne followed it, moving cautiously in the moonlight. He paused for a moment to listen, and then moved on. He came around to the side and saw just what he expected to see. Fifty-gallon metal drums ranged along the side wall. There were three of them, connected by a series of black hoses. And that made sense. All the gasoline on the island would have had to come here in drums. He tapped the drums softly with a knuckle. They were hollow. He lifted one, hoping to hear the slosh of liquid at the bottom. They needed only a gallon or two. Nothing. The drums were empty. But surely, he thought, there must be more than three drums... He did a quick calculation in his head. A lab this large would have had half a dozen support vehicles, maybe more. Even if they were fuel efficient, they'd burn 30 or 40 gallons a week. To be safe, the company would have stored at least two months' supply, perhaps six months' supply. That meant 10 to 30 drums. And steel drums were heavy, so they probably stored them close by, probably just a few yards. He turned slowly looking. 
The moonlight was bright, and he could see well. Beyond the store, there was an open space, and then clumps of tall rhododendron bushes which had overgrown the path leading to the tennis court. Above the bushes, the chain-link fence was laced with creeping vines. To the left was the first of the worker cottages. He could see only the dark roof. To the right of the court, nearer the store, there was thick foliage, although he saw a gap. A path! He moved forward, leaving the store behind. Approaching the dark gap in the bushes, he saw a vertical line and realized it was the edge of an open wooden door. There was a shed back in the foliage. The other door was closed. As he came closer, he saw a rusted metal sign with flaking red lettering. The letters were black in the moonlight. Precaution. Non fumare. Inflammable. He paused, listening. He heard the raptors snarling in the distance, but they seemed far away, back up on the hill. For some reason, they still had not approached the village. Thorn waited, heart pounding, staring forward at the dark entrance to the shed. At last he decided it wasn't going to get any easier. They needed gas. He moved forward. The path to the shed was wet from the night's rain, but the shed was dry inside. His eyes adjusted. It was a small place, perhaps twelve by twelve. In the dim light, he saw a dozen rusted drums standing on end, three or four more on their sides. Thorn touched them all quickly, one after another. They were light. Empty. Every one. Empty. Feeling defeated, Thorn moved back towards the entrance of the shed. He paused for a moment, staring out at the moonlit night. And then... As he waited, he heard the unmistakable sound of breathing. Inside the store, Levine moved from window to window, trying to follow Thorne's progress. His body was jumpy with tension. What was Thorne doing? He'd gone so far from the store, it was very unwise. Levine kept glancing at the front door, wishing he could lock it. He felt so unsafe with the door unlocked. Now Thorn had gone off into the bushes, disappearing entirely from view. And he had been gone a long time, at least a minute or two. Levine stared out the window and bit his lip. He heard the distant snarl of the raptors and realized they had remained up at the entrance of the laboratory. They hadn't followed the vehicles down, even now. Why not, he wondered. The question was welcome in his mind. Calming. Almost soothing. A question to answer. Why had the raptors stayed up at the laboratory? All kinds of explanations occurred to him. The raptors had an atavistic fear of the laboratory, the place of their birth. They remembered the cages and didn't want to be captured again. But he suspected the most likely explanation was also the simplest. That the area around the laboratory was some other animal's territory. It was scent marked and demarcated and defended, and the raptors were reluctant to enter it. Even the Tyrannosaur, he remembered now, had gone through the territory quickly without stopping. But whose territory? Levine stared out the window impatiently as he waited. What about the lights? Sarah called from across the room. I need light here. In a minute, Levine said. At the entrance to the shed, Thorn stood silently, listening. He heard soft, snorting exhalations like a quiet horse, a large animal waiting sound was coming from somewhere to his right. Thorne looked over, slowly. He saw nothing at all. Moonlight shone brightly over the worker village. He saw the store, the gas pumps, the dark shape of the jeep. Looking to his right, he saw an open space and clumps of rhododendron bushes, a tennis court beyond, nothing else. He stared, listening hard. The soft snorting continued hardly louder than a faint breeze. But there was no breeze. The trees and bushes were not moving. Or were they? Thorn had the sense that something was wrong. Something right before his eyes. Something that he could see but couldn't see. With the effort of staring, he began to think his eyes were playing tricks on him. He thought he detected a slight movement in the bushes to the right. The pattern of the leaves seemed to shift in the moonlight. Shift? Stabilize again. But he wasn't sure. Thorn stared forward, straining, 
and as he looked, he began to think that it wasn't the bushes that had caught his eye, but rather the chain link fence. For most of its length, the fence was overgrown with an irregular tangle of vines, but in a few places the regular diamond pattern of links was visible. There was something strange about that pattern. The fence seemed to be moving, rippling. Thorn watched carefully. Maybe it is moving, he thought. Maybe there's an animal inside the fence, pushing against it and making it move. That didn't seem quite right. There was something else. Suddenly, lights came on inside the store. They shone through the barred windows, casting a geometric pattern of dark shadows across the open clearing and onto the bushes by the tennis court. And for a moment, just a moment, Thorne saw the bushes beside the tennis court were oddly shaped, and that there were actually two dinosaurs, seven feet tall, standing side by side, staring right at him. The bodies seemed to be covered in a patchwork pattern of light and dark that made them blend in perfectly with the leaves behind them, and even with the fence of the tennis court. Thorne was confused. Their concealment had been perfect, too perfect, until the lights from the store windows had shone out and caught them in the sudden bright glare. Thorn watched, holding his breath, and then he realized that the leafy light and dark pattern went only partway up their bodies to mid-thorax. Above that, the animals had a kind of diamond-shaped crisscross pattern that matched the fence. And as Thorn stared, the complex patterns on their bodies faded. The animals turned to chalky white, and then a series of vertical striped shadows began to appear, which exactly matched the shadows cast by the windows. And before his eyes, the two dinosaurs disappeared from view again. Squinting, with concentrated effort, he could just barely distinguish the outlines of their bodies. He would never have been able to see them at all had he not already known they were there. They were chameleons, but with a power of mimicry unlike any chameleon Thorn had ever seen. Slowly, he backed away into the shed, moving deeper into darkness. My God! Levine exclaimed, staring out the window. Sorry, Harding said, but I had to turn on the lights. That boy needs help. I can't do it in the dark. Levine did not answer her. He was staring out the window, trying to comprehend what he had just seen. He now realized what he had glimpsed the day Diego was killed. That brief, momentary sense that something was wrong. Levine now knew what it was. But it was quite beyond anything that was known among terrestrial animals, and... What is it? She said, standing alongside him at the window. Is it Thorn? Look, Levine said. She stared out through the bars. At the bushes? What? What am I supposed to- Look! He said. She watched for a moment longer, and then shook her head. I'm sorry. Start at the bottom of the bushes, Levine told her. Then let your eyes move up very slowly. Just look, and you'll see the outline. He heard a sigh. I'm sorry. Then turn out the lights again, he said, and you'll see. She turned the lights out, and for a moment Levine saw the two animals in sharp relief, their bodies pale white with vertical stripes in the moonlight. Almost immediately, the pattern started to fade. Harding came back, pushed in alongside him, and this time she saw the animals instantly, just as Levine knew she would. No shit, she said. There are two of them? Yes, side by side. And is the pattern fading? Yes, it's fading. As they watched, the striped pattern on their skins was replaced by the leafy pattern of the rhododendrons behind them. Once again, the two dinosaurs blended into invisibility. But such complex patterning implied that their epidermal layers were arranged in a matter similar to the chromatophores of marine invertebrates. The subtlety of shading, the rapidity of the changes, all suggested... Harding frowned. What are they? She asked. Chameleons of unparalleled skill, obviously. Although I'm not sure one entirely justified in referring to them as chameleons, since technically chameleons have only the ability... What are they? Sarah said impatiently. Actually, I'd say they're Carnotaurus sestre. Type specimens from Patagonia, three meters in height with distinctive heads. You notice the short bulldog snouts and the pair of large horns above the eyes? Almost like wings. They're carnivores? Yes, of course. They have... Where's Thorn? He went to that clump of bushes to the right some time ago. I haven't seen him, but... What do we do? She said. Do? Levine said. I'm not sure I follow you. We have to do something, she said, speaking slowly as if he were a child. We have to help Thorn get back. I don't know how, Levine said. Those animals must weigh 500 pounds each, and there are two of them. I told him not to go out in the first place, but now... Harding frowned. Staring out, she said, Go turn the lights back on. I'd prefer to... Go turn the lights back on! Levine got up irritably. 
he had been relishing his remarkable discovery, a truly unanticipated feature of dinosaurs, although not, of course, entirely without precedent among related vertebrates. Now this little muscle-bound female was barking orders at him. Lean was offended. After all, she was not much of a scientist. She was a naturalist, a field devoid of theory. One of those people who poked around in animal crap and imagined they were doing original research. A nice outdoor life is all it amounted to. It wasn't science by any stretch. On! Harding shouted, looking out the window. He flicked the lights on and started to head back to the window. Off! Hastily, he went back and turned them on. On! He turned them on again. She got up from the window and crossed the room. They didn't like that, she said. It bothered them. Well, there's probably a refractory period. Yeah, I think so. Here, open these. She scooped up a handful of flashlights from one of the shelves, handed them to him, then went and got batteries from an adjacent wire rack. I hope these still work. What are you going to do? Levine said. We, she said grimly. We. Thorne stood in the darkness of the shed, staring outward through the open doors. Someone had been turning the lights on and off inside the store. Then for a while they remained on. But now suddenly they went off again. The area in front of the shed was lit only by moonlight. He heard something. Soft rustling. He heard the breathing again. And then he saw the two dinosaurs walking upright with stiff tails. Their skin patterns seemed to shift as they walked, and it was difficult to follow them, but they were moving towards the shed. They arrived at the entrance, their bodies silhouetted against the moonlight beyond, their outlines finally clear. They looked like small tyrannosaurs, except they had protuberances above the eyes, and they had very small, stubby forelimbs. The carnivores stuck their squarish heads down and looked into the shed cautiously, snorting, sniffing their tails swinging slowly behind them. They were really too big to come inside, and for a moment, he hoped that they would not. The first of them lowered its head, growled, and stepped through the entrance. Thorn held his breath. He was trying to think what to do, but he couldn't think of anything at all. The animals were methodical, the first one moving aside so the second one fit enter as well. Suddenly, Along the side of the store, a half dozen glaring lights shone in bright beams. The lights moved, splashing the bodies. Beams began to move back and forth in slow, erratic patterns like searchlights. The dinosaurs were clearly visible. They didn't like it. They growled and tried to step away from the lights, but the beams moved continuously, searching them, crisscrossing over their bodies. As the lights passed over their torsos, the skin paled in response reproducing the movement of the beams after the lights had moved on. Their bodies streaking white, fading to dark, streaking white again. The lights never stopped moving, except when they shone into the faces of the dinosaurs and into their eyes. The big eyes blinked beneath their hooded wings. The animals twitched their heads and ducked away as if annoyed by flies. The dinosaurs became agitated. They turned, backing out of the shed, and bellowed loudly at the moving lights. Still, the lights moved relentlessly swinging back and forth in the night. The pattern of movement was complex, confusing. The dinosaurs bellowed again and took a menacing step toward the lights. It was half-hearted. They clearly didn't like being around these moving sources. After a moment, they shuffled off, the lights following them, driving them away past the tennis courts. Thorn moved forward. He heard Harding say, Doc, better get out of there before they decide to come back. Thorne moved quickly towards the lights. He found himself standing beside Levine and Harding. They were swinging fistfuls of flashlights back and forth. They all went back to the store.